idea that there are no biological differences between men and women. It's the sort of thing you hear that, it just makes your jaw drop. So if the, if the fundamentalist Christians say, well, if, if homosexuality is nothing but a sociocultural construct, then why do we have to put up with it? Wrong. Now, I got in trouble well, for saying that because what mm -hmm. people claimed was that I was denying the existence of people who don't fit neatly into the gendered categories, well, which I wasn't the, um, doing at all. The campuses are, are, are overrun in large part with disciplines that have, in my estimation, no valid reason to exist. Hmm. I think disciplines like women's studies should be defunded. Mm -hmm. Any of the activist disciplines who, mm -hmm. who act, who, whose primarily, primary role is the overthrow of, 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 for example, of the patriarchy, which is about as ill-defined a concept as you could possibly formulate, mm -hmm. that it's enough, that we've, we've done enough public funding of that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. We're providing, we're providing full-time destructive employment for people who are doing nothing but causing trouble. I think they should be defunded because what they promote has zero intellectual credibility. Mm -hmm. Their research methods don't qualify as research methods. Mm -hmm. Their publications, 80% of humanity's publications now, garner zero citations. That's not very many citations. Mm -hmm. And it's... <laughs> so, and the little trick, as far as I can tell, is what happens is that people write something that no one will read. They know perfectly well that no one will read it. They circulate it around their, their tiny group of compatriots who mm -hmm. occupy the same little, little, what, a little area on the intellectual spectrum. So then it's peer reviewed. Then it's published by major journals who sell it at inflated prices to libraries who squirreled away to and, and only increase the noise to signal ratio in relationship to the sum total of human knowledge. Mm -hmm. It's a scam from top to bottom. Here's one of the things that really bothered me about what was going on in Ontario, and this is happening everywhere. And, and I, ma I made this claim when I made my first video, since we have to get into this. So the, the technical claim in, in the Ontario legisla legislation now, and this, is ha this has already happened in New York, by the way. This is not only a Canadian thing. It's happening in Australia. It's happening in New Zealand. It's happening everywhere. Here's the claim. There's biological sex, there's gender identity, there's gender expression, and there's sexual proclivity. And they vary independently. That's not true. Not a, not a bit of that is true. The correlation between biological sex and gender identity exceeds 0.99. It's virtually perfect. It's the very definition of non-independent. So you think, almost everyone who's biologically male identifies as biologically male. Almost everyone who identifies as biologically male dresses and acts male. That's the gender identity element. And almost everybody who is biologically male, who identifies as male, who dresses as male, is in fact heterosexual. Those things are incredibly tightly linked, but the technical claim in the legislation is that they vary independently. Wrong. Now, I got in trouble well, for saying that because what mm -hmm. people claimed was that I was denying the existence of people who don't fit neatly into the gendered categories, well, which I wasn't the, um, doing at all. What about the 0.01 or whatever the percentage may be that wouldn't fall neatly under that correlation? So, certainly if there were a perfect correlation, that would work, but if there's not, it would seem perhaps that you're excluding certain people. Right? So if, if most people tend to identify a certain way, but there is that 0.01 that's not... I'm sure. not, I was never denying their existence. Okay. I was denying the validity of the claim that those four levels of analysis existed independently of one another, which they don't. It's a false claim. And the reason that the, the radical social constructionists who are pursuing this line of reasoning, which is completely discredited as far as I'm mm -hmm. concerned, I don't think it's any better than claiming that the world is flat. Mm -hmm. The reason that they're pursuing it legally is because they know perfectly well that they've lost the scientific discussion. I mean, I debated someone on Canadian public television who had the gall to say that the, you know, the scientific consensus over the last four decades was that there was no biological differences between men and women. I mean, and that was I could, well, one of the things that was so absolutely absurd about that, and there were many things that were absurd about it, was that I was in trouble with the university at that point, and he wasn't. It's like, first of all, that is that is not the scientific consensus of the last four decades. It's, it's, it, and, and the idea that there are no biological differences between men and women, it's the sort of thing you hear that, it just makes your jaw drop. Now, what, what you could say is that if you took all the dimensions along which men and women vary, and, and there's a substantial number of them, that there's substantial overlap between men and women on almost all of the dimensions. Now, that's not particularly true with chromosomal identity, although there are some exceptions. Like with personality, for example, and I happen to be somewhat of an expert on personality, there are marked differences between men and women, but the overlap exceeds the differences. So, for example, women are higher in agreeableness. And you might say, well, that's socio-culturally constructed, but it turns out that it isn't. Because if you look across cultures 
and you, you look at the cultures that have moved most forward with, um, with gender equality provisions at the social and political le levels, and that would be the Scandinavian countries, the, the differences in personality between women, men and women maximize in those countries. And these are tiny studies. These are studies that involve tens of thousands of people and that have been well replicated by a series of independent researchers. And so if you add the personality differences between men and women across all the personality traits, you can almost perfectly segregate men from women. And that, has not, that, that doesn't take into account the obvious things like arm angle and hip width, hip, hip width compared to, to waist width and shoulder width and upper body strength and height and weight and the biochemical differences. And I mean, it's, it's so preposterous that it's, be, it's, it's beyond conception to me that we're actually even discussing it. But I was making a specific claim, which is the law says these four levels of analysis vary independently. The only reason they're associated with one another is for cultural reasons. No, mm -hmm. wrong. And you don't get to put fallacious scientific truths into the law. Mm -hmm. not or if you're going to do that, then I'm not going to abide by that particular law. I'm going to object to it, which is exactly what I should be doing. The law, as it's currently formulated, doesn't, in fact, it undermines the protection that these sorts of groups have been pursuing and seeking for years. So let's say, let's take the, mm -hmm. let's, let's accept the proposition that these vary independently or, or that they're only socio-culturally constructed. Mm -hmm. Okay, so where does that leave your discussion of homosexuality? So if the, if the fundamentalist Christians say, well, if, if homosexuality is nothing but a sociocultural construct, then why do we have to put up with it? It's a perfectly valid argument. They say, well, no, you know, people, people are born into their sexual proclivity. Now, I'm not saying that they are or not, because I, I'm not making either of those sure. cases. What I am pointing out is that the legislation and policies of that sort, as currently formulated, actually undermine the very arguments that many of the activist groups have been using to promote the fact that they, they are that they're deserving of their, of their non-standard identity, that the non-standard identity is justifiable. If your sexual proclivity is nothing but a whim, then why should I put up with it? Mm -hmm. So and I'm not willing in the slightest to presume that just because activist groups with this postmodern neo-Marxist ethic stand up and say, well, we're on the side of the oppressed, that that makes them A, on the side of the oppressed, or B, virtuous. I don't buy either of those arguments. I don't think they stand for what they say they stand for. I don't think they're promoting a doctrine that's going to do what they claim it will do. I don't believe that they're good and the rest of the world bad. I don't buy their oppressor-victim dichotomy. I don't admire their philosophical position. I think they don't know anything about history, or if they do know anything about history, then they're malevolent for pursuing exactly the same policies that led us into terrible situations before.